Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for a live roundtable conversation with the Terra 2022 partners from the Getty Conservation Institute, National Park Service Vanishing Treasures Program and University of Pennsylvania Stuart Weitzman School of Design. I'm Leslie Rayner, one of the team members representing GCI in Los Angeles, and I'd like to start this event with a land acknowledgement. On behalf of the GCI, I would like to acknowledge the Gabriel Lima Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. We pay our respects to the Honukvitam ancestors, Ahi Hiram elders, and Iuhinkem relatives and relations past, present, and emerging. This roundtable conversation is the first in a series of monthly virtual events leading up to Terra 2022, 13th World Congress on Earthen Architectural Heritage that will take place in Santa Fe, New Mexico from June 7 to 10, 2022, one year from now, and 50 years after the first meeting of specialists in Yazd, Iran in 72. Terra 2022 will provide specialists from around the world an opportunity to reflect on work that's been done in the past and envision where the field is going in the future. The monthly virtual lead up events will also celebrate the 50th anniversary of these conferences. Through these events, we hope to bring together professionals, practitioners, and a broad audience to stimulate conversations around Earth and Heritage. We've invited colleagues from around the world to present videos, interviews, podcasts, and webinars on the significance of earthen architecture, the people who work and live with earth, and how the field has developed. These events will showcase the wealth and significance of earthen heritage around the world and will be hosted by organizations including the University of Minho, Portugal, University of Cuenca, Ecuador, ICAMOS Isquia, Crater, the World Heritage Center, Community uh, Cornerstones, Community Partnerships, and others. For the first event of the series today, we've brought together the partner organizations of Terra 2022 for a discussion about their work related to Earth and Heritage and the issues and challenges they see facing the field. The next event on July 8th will be hosted by the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and will be a live conversation titled Showing Our Strength, Resilience and Compassion in the Indigenous Southwest. The August event will be a series of webinars from CCRAT 2021 on critical topics related to the conservation of earthen architecture, focusing on the southwestern US and northern Mexico. We'll be posting more events on the Terra 2022 website in the coming months, so stay posted and stay tuned. Next slide, please. To start off this event today, I would like to introduce Jean Marie Teutonico, Associate Director of the Getty Conservation Institute, who will be moderating this conversation. An architectural conservator with over 30 years of experience, she received degrees from Princeton University and Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Prior to joining the GCI in 1999, Jean Marie was on staff of ECROM in Rome and later at English Heritage in London. She has a long standing interest in earthen architectural conservation and has been involved in the field since the early conferences. She's an honorary member of ECOMOS International Scientific Committee on Earthen Architectural Heritage, among her many other achievements. Thank you, Jean Marie, and all of the panelists for starting off our series of virtual events leading up to Terra 2022. Well, thank you, Leslie for that introduction and um, my welcome as well to all of you who are joining us today from many parts of the world. Um, I should say with the Zoom fatigue that we're all experiencing, we really appreciate your being with us. I'm also very honored uh, to moderate this first event in this series, which as Leslie said, is a conversation with the partner organizations of Terra 2022, the Getty Conservation Institute, the National Park Service Vanishing Treasures Program, and the University of Pennsylvania Stuart Weitzman School of Design. Now for the past three years, actually, we've been working together with the ECOMOS International Scientific Committee on Earth and Architectural Heritage. And I have to say a really terrific group of colleagues on our scientific committee to develop the programs and themes of Terra 2022, which in addition to being the 50th anniversary of these conferences is also the first to take place in the United States since 1990. So I think an important event in many ways. And now, of course, each of our organizations has worked in this field for more than three decades. And I think in that time, um, we've watched the field grow and we've watched the community of practice expand quite considerably. Um, 
Together, we've been committed to advancing the field through research, through disseminating our own work, but also that of others increasingly in a variety of media and through convening and coming together to share experiences. So today, representatives from each partner organization is going to briefly present um, their own work. Then we're going to have a discussion amongst the panelists about some of the challenges and the most pressing issues that kind of emerge from those presentations. And then following that discussion, we will have a question and answer session to respond to some of the questions that you might pose. So just before we get started, I'd like to share just a few housekeeping notes. Um, firstly, um, attendees can use the question and answer box to ask the speakers questions. Um, the questions will be addressed at the end of the discussion, but please feel free to pose them at any time. Uh, we'll be monitoring the, the Q&A for uh, the discussion at the end. And of course, when we do uh, answer those questions, they'll be repeated aloud for everyone and for the panelists to hear. This event is being recorded um, and it will be available on the Terra 2022 website and on YouTube, we hope by early July. And then finally, you may enable or disable um, closed captioning by clicking on the CC button that's at the bottom of your screen. Okay, and now I'd like to introduce our three panelists. Firstly, Claudia Cancino, who manages the Earth and Architecture Initiative at the Getty Conservation Institute. Claudia graduated in architecture and urban planning from the Universidad de Ricardo de Palma in Lima, Peru, and earned a certificate in conservation at ECOM in 1995, followed by training in business administration at ASAN in Lima. She practiced preservation architecture and was on the faculty at the Universidad Peruana de Ciencias Aplicadas in Lima in the late 1990s, teaching restoration of monuments and earthen building techniques. She subsequently earned a Master of Science in Historic Preservation and an advanced certificate in conservation from the University of Pennsylvania. Lauren Meyer oversees the US National Park Service's Intermountain Historic Preservation Services Group, which includes the Vanishing Treasures Program. In this role, Lauren guides and provides support to parks and partners in the conservation of the significant yet fragile architectural heritage of the American West. With the National Park Service for 20 years, Lauren's focus areas include the conservation of archeological sites in the American Southwest, the development of tools for evaluating and addressing climate change risks and vulnerabilities, and the implementation of multidisciplinary approaches to cultural resource management. Lauren has a BA in archeological studies from Boston University and an MS in historic preservation, as well as an advanced certificate in architectural conservation from the University of Pennsylvania. And finally, Frank Matero, is Professor of Architecture and Chair of the Graduate Program in Historic Preservation at the Stuart Weitzman School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. There's a theme here. He's Director and Founder of the Center for Architectural Conservation, a member of the Graduate Group in the Department of Art History, and Research Associate of the University Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. He's Founder and Editor-in-Chief of Change Over Time, the International Journal on Conservation and the Built Environment, published by Penn Press. Frank's teaching and research are focused on historic building technology and the conservation of building materials with an emphasis on masonry and earthen construction, the conservation of archeological sites and issues related to preservation and appropriate technology for traditional societies and places. And with that, I will invite Claudia Cancino to make our first brief presentation on the work of the GCI. Thank you, Jean Marie, and welcome everybody. Uh, the GCI, uh, as Jean Marie has said, has been involved in the conservation of urban sites for over 30 years. I have been proudly part of that history, although there are many colleagues who have worked and still work within the institution moving this field forward. I would like to acknowledge Susan Mendona, Benjamin Marcus, and Lorena Macchioni, as well as Leslie and Jean Marie for the work they carry out as part of the DCA involvement on the conservation of urban sites. Next slide, please. In the late 1980s, the GCI began tackling uh, the performance, weathering, and durability of earth as a building material, analyzing effective uh, consolidants for historic uh, mud breaks. Preliminary laboratory results led in the 1980s 1988 to a collaborative project in Fort Selden in New Mexico in the United States. 
Initial findings of a variety of interventions were presented at an international conference called Adobe 90, organized by the GCI in collaboration with local partners. That same year, the GCI started the Getty Seismic Adobe Project, or GSAP, to develop and test minimally invasive reinforcing techniques for historic Adobe structures in California. In 1997, following the collaboration of the FAT forces, Crater, GCI, and ICROM created Project Terra. From 1998 to 2005, the partners organized the second FAT course in Peru, carry out research on urban substance binding properties, develop management plans for the sites of Chanchan in Peru, also Poyeda Serenio in Salvador, and organize a decorate surface colloquium in Mesa Verde, Colorado, in the United States. Next, please. Following the experience of the Terra project, the GCI started in 2006 the Urban Architecture Initiative. After earthquakes in Iran, in Pakistan, and Morocco, which prompted the organization of the GSAP Colloquium, the initiative concluded that the GSAP methodology was, was effective. However, its reliance on high-tech materials and professional expertise was a problem for its implementation worldwide. To address this, the GCI initiated in 2009 the Seismic Retrofitting Project, or SRP, in Peru. The SRP seeks to combine traditional construction systems and materials with high-tech analysis to design and test easy to implement seismic retrofitting techniques to improve the structural performance of urban buildings while minimizing, minimizing the loss of historic fabric. The final outcome is a set of guidelines which are now being developed by the Ministry of Culture of Peru and GCI consultants. Next, please. From 2011 to 2016, the GCI, in collaboration with CERCAS, developed the Conservation and Rehabilitation Plan for the Kashgar Territory in southern Morocco in order to tackle the topic of urban historic settlements in a multidisciplinary approach. The plan designed a methodology to be used as a model for similar urban sites in the region, and it was implemented while delivering training workshops on documentation, rehabilitation planning, material analysis, and practical conservation approaches. Next, please. Our experience working in Northern Africa highlighted the need of training on the conservation of urban sites within the urban fabric. This need is also present in contexts within the Middle East. Although both regions hold a variety of urban architecture, there were few target training opportunities. The GCI chose the city of Alain in Abu Dhabi as the location to develop a training program due to its ease rich urban heritage and for the variety of conservation approaches implemented by the Abu Dhabi Department of Culture and Tourism, a GCI partner. Additionally, the GCI decided to include a week in bordering country of a month. The first course was successfully organized in 2018 and was attended by 22 mid-career professionals. The GCI and its partner intend to carry on two additional courses in 2022 and 2024. Next, please. Dissemination of information is part of the GCI mission. The proceedings of the DCAC and the GSAP colloquium were published in 2016 and 2018, respectively. With the intention of organizing the first Terra conference in Africa, the GCI partnered with the Ministry of Culture in Mali in 2008. And proceedings were later published in English and in French. As part of the SRP and the plan for the Kashba Taurir, the GCI has published online a series of research reports detailing the project methodologies in English, Spanish, and French. Next, please. Part of this roundtable is to discuss what is next. Urban sites are undisputed a testament of human creativity and ingenuity. Their preservation is important because of its values and its being used as part of the world built environment. Additionally, urban sites were built to be maintained, so their conservation is very much linked with the preservation of the construction techniques know-how. I think there is more to be developed regarding particularly in situ testing for material characterization and repair maintenance <coughs> materials for urban sites, um, a better understanding of how changes in the surrounding environment due to excavation, climate change, or natural disaster affect the material is also needed. Similarly, methodologies to address how to deal with living urban sites within the urban fabric or urban historic settlements are also necessary. I think doing round tables like this one could help us to better identify additional and answer questions in the field. The Terra Congress are also excellent opportunities to understand the recent trends. In 2022, the partners today present will bring back, as Jamari said, the Terra Congress to the United States. 
32 years after Adobe Nighty and 50 years after the first Terra conference in Iran in 1972. I think it will be an important point in time to better understand what we have learned in the last 50 years and what is next. Now I leave the virtual floor to Lauren Mayer. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia, and much appreciation to everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm just gonna take a few minutes to briefly share with you the work and priorities related to the conservation of earth and heritage in the American Southwest of the National Park Service's historic preservation programs and specifically the Vanishing Treasures program. Next slide, please. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that this region has been occupied since time immemorial by indigenous people and the work that we do is done with respect to our traditionally associated communities and the tangible and intangible values represented by the varied and significant cultural resources within our national parks. Um, the desert Southwest is an area rich in earth and heritage representing thousands of years in his of history and multiple cultures, including indigenous Spanish, Mexican, American. Uh, the unique and blended earth and architectural traditions are evident across the landscape in varying states of preservation and in multiple climate zones, requiring unique and tailored approaches to maintenance and conservation. The material styles, building traditions, and preservation practices in the Southwest connect us to our Mexican neighbors and further to the global community tasked with maintaining both the physical structures and the building traditions. Um, in the area of preservation and maintenance responsibilities are on communities, tribes, federal and state land management entities, and private landowners, and work is supported by public and private entities, youth corps, volunteers, and others, all with varying levels of training and experience. Uh, major goals for all are the retention of historic fabric and the continuation of traditional practices. Uh, the National Park Service is responsible for the protection of hundreds of sites throughout the region, um, as noted um, on that map that you're seeing on your screen. A large percentage of those sites include earthen heritage in the form of archaeological sites, historic structures, and landscape features. Next slide, please. Um, so the U.S. government and the National Park Service has a long history of engagement in the conservation of earth and heritage in the Southwest, and particularly the conservation of places in an as-found condition. Um, beginning with the protection of the Great House of Casa Grande, which is the upper right image, um, in the latter part of the 19th century, and the stabilization activities of the early 20th century in places like Tumacacari, which is center, um, and Mesa Verde, Mesa Verde, the lower right image, um, and inclusive of entities like the Southwestern National Monuments Program of the 1920s and the later crew-based programs, all of which were responsible for the development of stabilization approaches for many of the iconic resources in the area, and the testing and experimentation of materials in an attempt to find that silver bullet, the thing that would slow or arrest deterioration of fragile earth and building materials within these sites. Next slide, please. Um, the Vanishing Treasures program is the current iteration of these National Park Service programs in the region. Um, it's an effort that began in the late 1990s uh, that supports the preservation of the deteriorating and significant heritage architecture with a particular focus on the desert southwest um, with the purpose of moving from reactive preservation approach to more proactive approaches. Um, we also facilitate the perpetuation of traditional building craft and technologies through staff, youth, and partner-focused training and promote connections between culturally associated communities and places of their heritage. For Vanishing Treasures and its predecessors, preservation of earthen sites in an as-found condition has posed a great challenge, um, retaining fragile historic fabric without compromising site values. Work has and continues to require collaboration of multiple disciplines to come up with acceptable approaches that protect varying site values, provide stability, slow and prevent loss of original construction materials, limit the need for restoration and reconstruction, allow the site to be viewed, interpreted, and understood by the public, and ensure survival of a collection of unique yet fragile resources. Next slide, please. The current focus areas of the program include uh, partnerships, so establishing and continuing partnerships with federal and state agencies, universities, non-governmental organizations, tribes, and others to increase capacity, and allow us to better address critical needs related to the conservation of earth and heritage in national parks and to build a broader community of advocates. Um, revisiting approaches to assessment and treatment with an emphasis on evaluation of previous and existing treatment materials and techniques and development and testing of new. Better understanding material performance characteristics through lab testing and in situ monitoring, identification and assessment of structural issues and development of minimally invasive techniques for corrections and making use of available technology alongside traditional knowledge to better assess and predict failure. 
um, taking an interdisciplinary and systems-based approach to site management, so looking at things holistically to determine causality and understand interrelationships between site elements, and developing forward-thinking and tailored monitoring approaches to better understand how materials and structures perform in order to get to that proactive rather than reactive solution. Um, understanding and responding to risks and threats with a particular focus on climate change. We're currently developing tools and approaches to identify and quantify threats and vulnerabilities of earthen building materials and further to prioritize response activities. Um, training, so developing and providing training in traditional trades and maintenance of historic earthen construction through workshops and events such as the TCRAT and CCRAT. Um, sharing best practices and empowering practitioners at every level to be advocates. We also engage youth core and traditional and local communities, students, professionals, and in park practitioners through our training. Um, and finally, creating a community of practice focused on conservation of earthen heritage within the National Park Service. And this is to connect, create connectivity across parks, resources, and management entities to avoid constant reinvention and to share successes and failures. Next slide, please. And to close, just a few of our current critical concerns, which I imagine are fairly universal. Um, like many of you, um, we are currently suffering from a loss of local and skilled practi practitioners in urban building craft, um, which our training program is attempting to remedy, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And then the direct pressures on resources. So increasing visitation, um, and that increased visitation obviously causes an increase to human cause degradation. Um, across the National Park Service, our visitation numbers have increased exponentially over the years with 2020 being the exception because of closures. Um, and then finally, climate change. So the Southwest is noted as one of the global hotspots based on projections, and we have a critical need to understand vulnerability and risk in order to, de to develop those proactive approaches. The majority of the earthen sites are in a state of decay, um, leaving them extremely vulnerable. Um, these issues and others are forcing us to reevaluate our preservation approach and philosophies as we grapple with degradation and loss in light of our reduced capacity, unpredictability of conditions, and changing site uses. Um, so with that, thank you for the opportunity to share with you. I look forward to the discussion, and I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Frank Matero. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren. It's a, a pleasure to be with you all this morning, uh, at least where I am, uh, and especially with my esteemed colleagues and close uh, personal friends on the panel. Uh, I'm joining you from the San Luis Valley in southeastern Colorado, which is the ancestral home of the Ute, the Cheyenne, the Arapaho, and the Apache peoples, um, where indigenous and Hispano earthen heritage is still alive and quite present in the landscape. Um, I think we can, we can all agree that in the conservation of all built heritage, um, earthen sites probably rank as one of the most intractable of problems to be confronted. Um, as, a, as a building material, earth has many admirable properties, certainly good compressive strength, excellent thermal capacity, and it, it is abundant and available at no or low cost. So I, I'm going to use my, um, my time this morning more as a provocation um, to set us up for some questions uh, that will follow, but also to suggest how we might move the field of a conservation of earth and heritage in a slightly different direction. Um, earth sensitivity to moisture and its requirement for constant monitoring and constant maintenance often discredits earth as a viable material, certainly in contemporary eyes whether we're dealing with functional buildings or fragmented buildings um, such as ruins. Uh, the impossible demands of simultaneously preserving architectural form uh, and original fabric challenge all conservation professionals who attempt to manage both. So I would suggest we need to revisit what these concepts mean for earthen uh, heritage. Um, I will call that mud brick metaphysics. Um, which is to say, what is the nature of Earth? Now, to, to go back to the to the essence of what is Earth and it's how has it been how has that knowledge been used uh, in its construction? It's used as a construction material, and how has that nature uh, been revealed by weathering and our embrace rather than rejection of that process? Uh, next image, please. So. 
Any con consideration, therefore, must begin with the three modalities of tangible heritage. And, and I uh, have identified those as um, architectural fabric, the, ma the material, the form, and the function, uh, or what we might think of as content. Um, all tangible heritage can be described by these three modalities, and any intervention outcome uh, usually engages them all. These are important to consider in tandem. And in, therefore, um, and if there is anything I've learned after 39 years of teaching and practice, it is as Miles Orville wrote in 1989, conservation and preservation have no meaning or purpose without a concept of the real, the original, the authentic. But we must also be mindful that despite the universality of such a model, the idea of of permanence and monumentality, especially as we've learned it through years of conservation, for example, of masonry buildings, this has established a sort of implicit bias in our attitude and treatment of earthen structures. Earthen ruins present a very different reality when it comes to weathering. Classic conservation theory, which is heavily invested in material authenticity and age value, does not comfortably accommodate earthen buildings and especially archaeological sites. We employ a wide range of approaches to balance or favor the formal or the material or both. Next, please. Um, as Lauren has already mentioned, in the American Southwest, there is a diverse and long-lived earthen construction tradition uh, that constitutes many of our most important ancient monuments and sites, and she showed many of them. There's, there's also an equally long tradition of conservation approaches beginning, as she said, with the first federal effort to preserve uh, the site of Casa Grande in Arizona. Uh, and since then, there has been uh, a number of interesting attempts to preserve and interpret excavated and as found earthen sites, resulting in a wide range of solutions, some more successful than others. Without clarity of thought and critical management, multiple approaches can result in what I have called terra schizophrenia, a combination of either formless lumps and bumps devoid of meaning in a perpetually renewing plaster shroud or veneer where fabric trumps all. Or, uh, and, you, and you might, I might suggest that's what you see here on the screen at Fort Union. Or uh, an alternative, uh, a piebald riot of repairs all competing with each other in an attempt to define their own individual authenticity. Or finally, the perennially renewed architectural element enforcing process as much as form in an effort to exert timeless building traditions. So I wanna take time um, uh, to pause and ask ourselves uh, what our overall goals are, and in fact, if the end justifies the mean. And to do this, um, um, the most recent work we've been doing at the University of Pennsylvania has been to uh, take advantage of the, um, of the great difficulties that climate uh, change and climate vulnerability um, have suggested for earthen architecture uh, in the arid uh, West. Large scale damage, as Lauren mentioned, appears to be, uh, appears to be escalating at a number of sites uh, in the American Southwest, such as Fort Union, and now may be the time to revisit our conservation strategies. Uh, studying causes such as weather through predictive climate modeling and changing our responses. That is going beyond simply mitigation and resilience to actually adaptation and seeing weathering as a form of adaptation, responsive adaptation. Um, we've chosen to do that through a number of sites, but Fort Union really remains the Manhattan Project uh, for post-war preservation of Adobe sites in the US. Um, nothing comes close to the incredible uh, 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 diversity of approaches um, over um, um, 70 years uh, of efforts. Uh, next, please. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, next. So um, I would suggest that we do this through a series of questions related to environmental context, to pathologies, to conservation past and present, that is legacy data, which I think we, we need to spend much more time analyzing. Um, and. We've done this by setting up a series of research agendas looking at uh, original construction, um, for example, to identify potential and 
apparent vice. Not all traditional building was well built. Uh, past conservation and present, present maintenance, uh, uh, a re-examination of our knowledge of uh, earthen deterioration um, at a multi-scalar approach at the micro, the meso, and the macro, um, to look at weather and climate data and monitoring at Fort Union, monitoring goes back to 1851, a very rare and incredible opportunity to look at um, weather data and its effects um, on one side. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, the question really is what are the primary and secondary factors influencing deterioration and failure and which ones can we mitigate and manage? Next, please. So I think we need to consider some new paradigms for conserving earth and architecture. We have much data now on climate change itself, but we have very little evidence-based quantitative data on what is happening to build heritage and what that looks like over time, especially at the building or mesoscale. Research on cultural heritage and risk from climate change entered the research agendas in 2003. We need to begin to utilize those concepts uh, and the language from climate change scientists, especially those studying natural uh, ecosystems. And I, I place some of these concepts on the screen, suggesting we need to embrace these, some we already have, but into our consideration of how to manage earthen sites. We need to consider all site vulnerabilities from intrinsic factors, such as the materials in construction, the age, and the maintenance to larger aspects of climate and policy. This will allow us to fashion better responses going beyond even the current and not so new anymore paradigm of preventive conservation. And in post-Katrina language, embrace resilience or adaptation, where we need to embrace a different approach rather than simply improve existing solutions. Um, that is what we mean by non-anticipatory uh, science that climate change has um, created. And last image, we need to be better observers and recorders of earthen sites, not just by throwing more technology at it, but by understanding how earthen buildings have been subtly responding to their environment over time through weathering, and then learn from them in introducing a more preventive mode of intervention that works with the material rather than against it. Um, and one example I've thrown up on the screen is this concept of the rapid assessment survey, whereby all direct and indirect site data has been compiled and analyzed and displayed um, to identify um, a site's specific physical vulnerabilities and therefore inform a smarter conservation and management program. That, I think, is the metaphysical challenge. So thank you very much. Um, it's my pleasure now to turn the uh, screen over to uh, Jean Marie Tutomico. Okay, yes, and if we could have, I think, all of the panelists back on the screen so that we can kick off our conversation. Great. Okay, fantastic. Well, firstly, thank you to all of you for those really dense uh, presentations. I know it's always difficult to put lots of information into about seven minutes, um, but I think you've given us a lot of food for thought and discussion. I'm hoping this can be a pretty spontaneous conversation, which is always hard to do on Zoom, but we're going to try. But I've organized a series of questions just around some of the themes that I think emerged from your talks, and then we'll, we'll see where this goes, um, starting with kind of the nature of earth as a building material and ending up with then our evolving approaches to the conservation of both earth and heritage and, and earth building practice. So, so maybe to start from um, some basics, um, kind of after 50 years of, of Terra conferences and work done all over the world, to get to Frank's point, is earth as a building material properly understood? And maybe as a corollary to that, um, should heritage specialists really consider the conservation of earth in a category by itself different from other traditional building materials, given perhaps, Frank, what you were saying about, you know, the specific characteristics of, of Earth and what that entails. So who would like to begin? Frank, do you want to kick us off, perhaps, and then 
Please, you're, you're muted, Frank. So to your question, uh, is Earth as a building material properly understood? Well, I think uh, soil scientists and, and certainly uh, uh, scientists who've been working on Earth and heritage would say, sure, yes. Um, although I think, um, as I think many would agree, it's empirical local knowledge-based practice will probably continue to diminish as the forces of globalization uh, and modernization erode its usage. So I, I think, um, you know, on the one hand, uh, perhaps from a, a scientific perspective, I think we know a great deal about the weathering processes. Um, I think um, the issue, uh, which others can take up certainly and have, is the issue of earth as a practice, uh, as a building practice. Uh, Lauren alluded to this. Um, I guess what I was also saying is uh, we have to spend more time on the meso and macro uh, scales of understanding how earthen buildings adapt to their environment. Right. And perhaps in that they're somewhat different than some other traditional systems. Right. It's actually a meeting of, of the two areas of expertise, right? Right. Lauren, do you want, or Claudia, do you want to add something? Sure, go ahead. No, I think I agree with Frank that, um, I mean, a lot in the last uh, three years have been done regarding trying to understand how Earth works at the macro, at the micro level, the molecular level, that have helped uh, for practitioners to actually design better type of interventions. What I think is still missing is uh, a little bit like in situ, uh, you know, fast uh, type of design of interventions that are compatible with, uh, with the materials. I think that's the part that we are still uh, missing. That a lot had to do with this, um, with the ability to keep and preserve the know-how of um, of the techniques, right? Because if you have been building on Earth continuously, you have an understanding of how the material works. But if that has a stop in time, it's very different for practitioners to actually go back and um, try to understand and try to decide the best uh, type of interventions. Institutions like ours, I think we have the time and the funds and the opportunity to actually further this type of studies that practitioners in the field don't have. So I, I think uh, that is something that will be developed in the next, uh, mm -hmm. next phase, in the next 15 years. Mm -hmm. Lauren, did you want to say, I, I saw you wanting to respond. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, and, and I'd agree with that. I think, um, you know, as site managers, we're so heavily dependent on our partners to be able to create these long-term studies to better understand. And I agree, I think there's a good understanding for the material of Earth, but I think every site is so unique um, that you really have to understand the performance, the construction, you know, the, the actual materials that were used in combination to build any particular structure. Um, you know, so the design characteristics, the material composition, application techniques, um, and then the particular environments that these sites are in, right? Because all of those things have an impact on how the material degrades and will influence the decisions that you make about interventions, right? So even though we understand the material itself and that it's highly susceptible to certain environmental conditions, all of that is very um, specific, very site specific. Right, and sometimes we just don't have the as mm -hmm. the, the macro data mm -hmm. that really helps us to make decisions, especially in in times of, of changing. Um, and I think in, in terms of you know if we, if we in terms of you know threats to heritage or you know kind of I mean I think climate change obviously rose you know right to the top in in all of your presentations. Um, as you know, a one of the, the the current risks. I mean, not just not just to Earth and heritage, but of course to our to our planet more broadly. But I mean, mm -hmm. regards Earth and heritage, um, which is incredibly susceptible to to changing climate. Um, obviously, this is this is a big concern. And I think all of you spoke a little bit about what is needed. But if we want to talk about you know what research is still needed in this realm. Frank, you talked a little bit about looking at legacy data, that kind of thing, but you know, what is it that we need to know in order to understand how, you know, environmental changes are going to affect the long-term preservation of earthen sites. And then I think a corollary to that, which you alluded to a little bit, um, Lauren, was you know, 
how does the reality of climate change impact our approach to preservation and maybe you know our feelings about the potential loss of heritage i mean how do we grapple with the idea of maybe having to let some things go um, mm -hmm. particularly with when dealing with you know uh, earthen heritage and the fragility of earthen building materials so there's there's slightly different questions i mean one more about like what we need to know but the other about you know how do we how do we cope with these feelings of or these the reality perhaps of not being able to save everything well, I, I, uh, I'll jump in. I mean, I think okay. that's been that's been a, a conundrum for all heritage, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's why uh, systems of uh, values-based systems have been developed and continue to evolve. Um, I, I, I would I would say though that um, to get back to the point of uh, of of, cl of the of what climate change has afforded us, um, I think it's just given us an excuse, but I think a very valid one to re-examine what we know and what we don't know, and to take uh, what, what Lauren has, um, has said uh, a, a number of times, which is an integrated systemic uh, approach to looking at the ways in which earthen sites change over time in the landscape. That, that is something we, we still have a lot of work to do on. Um, yes, we have, there's a lot of anecdotal and uh, uh, understanding, there's a lot of uh, scientific monitoring that goes on, but the reality is it needs to all be brought together um, in a way that is time and cost effective, quite honestly, because it is easy to spend a great deal of money on programs that collect data for data's sake. And I think in order to manage smarter and better, we have to uh, work in a way that gets us the information we need to know to manage um, these sites. Uh, yesterday at the Secret uh, meeting, I, I, you know, I could not say enough that I think the, uh, the secret of better uh, conservation of earthen sites is simply um, monitoring and maintenance. We spend so much time on intervention strategies when in fact it really is uh, been, I think, at the expense of uh, spending time thinking about monitoring and certainly maintenance, as everyone knows. Frank, if I can just ask you, let me just just uh, just a follow up, and then Claudia, I'll get to you. But I mean, when you talk about you, know, how do you make sort of monitoring um, a bit more robust, robust, but also possibly cost effective or not seem right. onerous, you know, as as something that's just like we don't have time to do this, you know, right. possibly do this. So that has been the thrust of the five year work we've been doing with the National Park Service. Um, um, and again, it's not just to generate more data, it's to uh, look at that data uh, from various perspectives, from various specializations, to see what is perhaps more useful than others, again, in terms of the objectives that Lauren and, and all of you have in terms of managing or recommending strategies for site management. Um, I, I, you know, it's a multi-pronged approach. I, I mentioned legacy data. Um, if you think of buildings as an accumulation of evidence, um, weathering over time can be read on a building uh, from the day it opens to the day of its demise. Um, and so if we can learn to run that film backwards uh, and look at the various episodic events, um, tease them apart, look at them um, um, in combination to use tools to do that, whether it's uh, real-time monitoring of the moisture, temperature, um, wind, uh, to take use time-lapse photography, to um, do a rapid assessment survey. I mean, some of these are proof of concept methods. Once you understand the site, you can put those away and then you can move to a much more, I think, simplified but predictable model that will guarantee you get the information you need at the time you need it. I think, uh, you know, it's easy to spend a lot of money on these kinds of uh, approaches, but I think it's an embrace of all of them and understanding their role uh, in what you're trying to do. Claudia, did you want to? You had a comment that you wanted to make. You're muted, Claudia. Unmute yourself. There you go. Thanks. Sorry, I just, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, it is true that uh, the monitoring aspect for the understanding of, uh, you know, the weathering of, of, of a site, particularly an archaeological site, I think it's extremely important because the data that, that we can get can help, 
you know, the management plans to deal with something um, that is critical, that is preparedness. I think, uh, you know, like all the data that we can obtain about climate change and how that affects our site should be embedded into a plan to help us prepare for future, uh, future changes. You know, like, um, you know, at the beginning, for example, in the ecological side of Chang Chang, when we have the first El Nino seasons, you know, it's like, you know, suddenly we have to cover these enormous uh, urban cities to prepare them from the rain and then suddenly also prepare them from the floods. I think if we use the data that is collected by other fields also uh, of risk preparedness, we can actually design uh, future uh, interventions to protect uh, those sites. But I think it will be uh, very important. And on that topic, something that it has always been an interest of me is a little bit what Lauren said on her, her presentation. It's like, you know, there are institutions that are in charge of a variety, huge amount of um, urban archaeological sites. Right? I think, for example, in, uh, in Lima, in, in my city, you have hundreds of urban sites that are embedded within the urban fabric. And I think it, it, there is a tendency and it's a good tendency for institutions to actually address the problem systematically to all of those sites rather than just being reacted to you know, each of them uh, individually. I think the Abu Dhabi Department uh, of Culture and Tourism is doing the same mm -hmm. with their sites within uh, the rural fabric. And I think that is also uh, very important. But I also wanted to make the distinction between the approach that we could have with an archaeological site, uh, that sometimes for me it's a paradigm, paradigm because you know, urban sites were designed to be maintained. I mean, that's part of their nature. So when you have an archaeological site that you want to sort of like hold and go preserve on, you know, freeze on time, it's very challenging because those sites were designed and constructed to be maintained. So that's the difference between, in my opinion, the approach to archaeological sites and to urban historic buildings that, you know, if you have the know-how, you can continuously, you know, maintain and keep up the, the site. Uh, it's, I mean, it's another topic, but I think maintenance is also, maintenance and preparedness are both key to, to you know, interventions. Yeah, I think two things that are emerging is one to use data to kind of prioritize, you know, resources and intervention and where you engage. But the other thing that, you know, is coming through loud and clear is that also uh, regular maintenance, you know, is something that is is intrinsic to this to this technology, but that demands that you conserve not just the heritage but also the skill and the knowledge systems that that created that created it so that that can continue to happen. Lauren, did you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, Claudia. I think, um, you know, for, for our programs, a lot of what we're doing is really focused on archeological resources and um, short of a huge influx of money and people, um, you know, the that development of that basic understanding and prioritization is critical, right? And, you know, we, we have these federal mandates to preserve in perpetuity these sites um, that are, fragile and you know we can't depend on historic norms of weather nor of degradation right we understand generally you know that history tells us how materials will degrade um, you know when exposed to certain conditions but those conditions are changing right so we can't depend on those historic norms anymore so I think you know Frank was talking earlier about monitoring I think for us that's critical you know we need to be developing better approaches to monitoring identifying those areas that are most at risk so that we can focus our interventions in those areas rather than taking this blanket reactive approach to things and I think over time we're realizing that and you know I agree that climate change is forcing us to sort of rethink things right rethink our preservation philosophies rethink our approaches um, you know, I think the skill set, of course, is just as critical as the resources, right? So how do we continue developing those skill sets so that we can make sure we have the people out there who have the capabilities to do the work and maintain the resources? It's, it's a race, though, right? Um, maintenance on archaeological resources, you know, we just can't keep up. So being targeted, monitoring and prioritizing becomes the thing for us. Frank, yes. So I, I want to 
I want to take that opportunity now that you both have set up and move us a bit from monitoring to intervention. Um, mm -hmm. You know, climate change has been a convenient wake up call to re-examine our motives and our methods. Mm -hmm. um, I think as both Lauren and Claudia have suggested. I, I would push back a bit though. And I would say that um, I, I think everyone on the call will agree that monitoring is an essential part of informed conservation practice. My gripe right now um, is, um, or my suggestion is that if climate change is delivering uh, stresses, uh, stressors that we can have, that we cannot predict, um, either because they are more extreme or they're occurring in greater frequencies, um, and they're producing different kinds of responses or simply more intense responses to what we already know then we have to change what we're doing, or we have to at least re-examine what we're doing. And, and I would suggest, uh, and, and again, everyone on the call knows there is a difference. C context is everything. When you're talking about a living historic site versus a living uh, a whole site versus a living fragmented site, uh, I'll, I'll resist the R word, um, um, uh, that, that context means everything in terms of how you approach it. But I would push back a bit. Uh, Claudia mentioned the idea of freezing it in time. I think we have to get away from that idea. Um, uh, Earth doesn't want us to do that. It wants us to recognize its transformation. And I think we have to respond in ways that are adaptive. Um, and so I think we've got to move on that triangle a bit away from form, uh, sorry, a bit away from fabric and more towards form and function, particularly when we're talking about archaeological sites. Um, I, I just think the status quo, it's not going to work, particularly given what we are facing in terms of extreme weather events. And Lauren showed that by now it's the poster child of climate change in the West, the catastrophic collapsed walls at Fort Union, which occurred um, overnight. So how, I mean, you know, given, given that, I mean, and I think, you know, given what you were all saying about this, I mean, that's obviously very reliant on, you know, having a, a, a skill set that still exists, right, regarding regular maintenance of, of buildings and sort of earth building tradition. I mean, so, so how do we, you know, it, preserve traditional practices, you know, in the context of earth and heritage? And on some level also, what is the intersection between, you know, heritage conservation um, and traditional building, you know, in earth. Um, Claudia? I mean, I think uh, I mentioned a little bit uh, when, I, uh, when I talked before, for me, the intersection between the two of them is the, the, um, the issue of maintenance. I think, uh, it's extremely difficult to maintain a site when you don't have the know-how or the know-how is lost, right? I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's another challenge when you don't have the practice uh, sort of alive. I mean, you have many countries in the world that have a great variety of urban sites that are not, uh, that are living sites and people, actually keep building uh, on earth, uh, you know, Peru is uh, of course one of them. And you also have the academia who actually continuously trying to improve the current techniques to make them seismically safe. Uh, so it's not that just that the, the know-how is there, but it's also getting improved over time uh, for better performance. But I think um, if you don't have that uh, know-how is pretty, pretty challenging and you have to sort of start relying on archival research about you know where the original materials were taken on the side how those materials were used and mixed and it's a different uh, a different type of approach I will say and that's when for me you know the support of uh, new construction <clears throat> also help us um, for the conservation of urban sites because it preserves the know-how over time. Um, yeah, and I'll, you know, on that, I think, you know, for us, some of this is about being able to just continually express the value of 
earth as a building material and of those traditions and of the cultural heritage that is extant on the landscape, right? And ensuring that that value is sort of seen and felt within traditional communities and with the general public, right? And I think for us, a lot of that is, you know, the way we work with that is through constant early and continuous communication, consultation, you know, with our tribal partners and with local communities, right, to continue speaking to them and developing and providing opportunities that aren't just one off opportunities for someone to step into a park and learn the trade, but also have an opportunity to be employed and to see that there are actual, again, work opportunities to do this as a job. Right. Um, you know, I think over time for us, I mean, part of the reason why our program was created, it wasn't only for the preservation of the physical resources, but also to ensure the perpetuation of those traditional practices, right? And it's been the biggest challenge, I think, for our program over the 20 year history, right? Um, these practices exist within a lot of these traditional communities, but they're disappearing within those communities as technology becomes the thing, or it already is the thing, right? Um, and to be able to sort of turn back and bring people back in and create that interest again, I think a lot of it, again, has to do with valuing the resources and the trades. Yes, sure, Frank. So, I, you know, I think both Lauren and Claudia and certainly Jean Marie, I mean, in your work at the GCI and the Park Service, you know that in order to preserve uh, traditional practices in the context of earth and heritage conservation, we need to make the knowledge and the skills valued through recognition and remuneration in their own communities. I mean, that's a, that's a big uh, obligation and task that a conservation project has, particularly in dealing with living earth and heritage. Um, and the second thing is we need to ensure knowledge and practices stay embedded in social and cultural traditions. This is a, again, in Peru, I, I'm thinking of my experiences in Turkey, what I saw in Peru, um, uh, what I directed in Turkey. Um, it, you know, these are big issues and big problems that take um, a, a whole community and a few NGOs, you know, to, to make it really happen. Um, I also think though we have to be, um, uh, we can't conflate um, uh, the, uh, you know, the goals and objectives of, um, of, of, of business as usual in terms of earth, earth and construction and conservation um, objectives. I think we have to see that they are linked, but they have different objectives, if you will. Um, yeah. No, absolutely. And I, I think if I could just say, or Claude, if you want to respond and then I'll, I'll move on, because I think this whole issue of communities and how we engage, you know, with uh, communities and balance, you know, preservation practice with community needs and values is also an important one. And there are a number of questions that are starting to appear in the chat, which we might want to address. But go ahead, Claudia. Oh, I just uh, I just wanted to add also in the same things that you were saying, generally, the importance of evolving the community in uh, the whole process of uh, the conservation of a site. I mean, you have witnessed, Jamari, how we have actually have involved the community in the process of the for the retrofitting of the Church of Utambo. One of the things that we did that I think it was it was very important is that at the same time that the church was being studied and then uh, retrofitted, we decided, but it was because it was pretty challenging for our team to stay for weeks in uh, camping in Cunyotambo, we decide to build a house for the project, right? And for that, we use, uh, you know, the traditional architectural typology of the town. About, and we prove that, you know, you can build an earthen house with, you know, living modern conditions. And, uh, and for that, we also work with the community to build the house. So we did it seismically resistant, we did it up to code, we did it, uh, you know, like with all the uh, commodities. And, you know, the, that house is the house that we use when we go and work there. And then, you know, a few years later, the, goal is gonna, the house is going to go back to the community. And I think that engagement uh, over time has been extremely important. And there are other really good uh, experiences um, you know, Cuenca in Ecuador is really doing uh, a really good job on that as well. 
uh, in the Southwest as well, involved in communities. And I think it's critical because you actually help um, to preserve the know-how and directly for uh, you know, future generations. So I think it's impossible to do an intervention in any kind of urban sites, either archaeological sites or historic buildings, without engaging the community. I mean, at this point, it's extremely, extremely difficult uh, and impossible, really. That might be a good place. We're, we're starting to have a lot of questions in the, in the Q&A, so I'm thinking maybe it's a good time to go to a couple of those. I mean, we had, um, we had actually two sort of related to some of the things that we were just talking about. Um, from Hosamadi, monitoring and maintenance were part of traditional lifestyles of building earth and living in them. Is there room for integrating traditional wisdom and approaches in the management of earth and heritage, particularly vernacular heritage? And then a, a similar question, I think, from Fausto Cardoso, how, the community, how can communities um, become protagonists of preventive conservation of earth and architecture, especially in places where economic resources are not always available? How do we engage um, communities responsibly? And do you think there are general guidelines for that, obviously, or must each place find its own strategy? We've talked about a few of those things, but. Well, I mean, all, all I'll say is um, for those who know the literature, a great many of our colleagues have published on this subject. Um, examples in uh, Mali, uh, in Yemen. I mean, there are, I mean, Claudia can probably speak to this even more. Um, I, the, the, the case studies and examples are out there. What, what we need to do is keep promoting them as the rule rather than the exception. Um, I, I, I think, um, uh, and, and recognize that while again, we talk about um, the need to do this and develop a strategy, it has to be local. It all is in the end local. It's not some kind of blueprint that you can simply uh, apply uh, globally. I'll say, you know, I think, you know, we are very cognizant and work really hard to ensure that traditional practices are incorporated into our preservation approach for resources, particularly in the parks. Um, you know, we fall back on uh, those traditional approaches as the best way to maintain earth and heritage, right? Um, you know, using shelter coating, um, protective coatings, and I don't mean, uh, you know, sort of chemical coatings, but protective earthen coatings or lime shelter coats on uh, earthen construction. Um, using traditional tools and techniques for the application of such. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, the other pieces, you know, obviously we can't always be dependent on those traditional approaches depending on conditions, but, you know, understanding and being very selective about it, engaging those communities early and often and engaging them in the conversation about preservation, right? Understanding the values of the site and ensuring that we're working towards the preservation, not only of the physical, but also the intangible values, right? Um, and, you know, for us, you know, especially when we're working with tribes, right, there's a different perspective on degradation and deterioration of resources and being selective about where we're heavy handed um, and really looking towards some of those more traditional and natural materials and preservation becomes really important. And again, we strive to do that. Um, it can't be done everywhere all the time. Um, but if you look across the range of resources that we work with, primarily that's what we're doing. So traditional techniques, traditional tools, we're reaching into communities. A lot of the staff in our parks actually come out of those traditional and local communities. Um, there are multi-generational families that have worked in parks, bringing their, their skill sets in and applying them to resource preservation. Um, and now, um, you know, we're working with, say, youth cores and developing programs to engage young people to do similar things. So I think I agree. I think it's very important to ensure that those vernacular traditions are being used in um, decision making and we're using them and applying them in our preservation approach. Just looking at some of the other questions mm -hmm. and you and you've kind of answered a little bit more in this question for Mary, Mary Santana, which is, you know, a deal of science is being developed and that's very positive, obviously. Mm -hmm. After the lack of skilled craftsmanship in repairing historic broken architecture assemblies, a major problem is the lack of specialized educational 
programs. And you've talked a bit about what you've been trying to do to kind of identify that. Would either of the other speakers like to address that, the issue of, of kind of training or how you, how you keep whatever traditional system there is of knowledge transfer alive? Um, well, I just um, would like to, I don't want to be talking about Peru all the time, but, you know, I lived there for half of my life. But, <laughs> but um, you know, in uh, one of the most important things that happened, I think, for the conservation of further sites generally in Peru was that there was one uh, dean of an architecture school who decided, you know, what if I'm going to, Training architects, I'm just gonna teach them um, how to build on earth. And that was the first course um, of a series of courses in the structures and materials of the whole career. And he was also, you know, sort of visionary and said, okay, I'm gonna have a man and a woman teaching that, uh, that course. And so, and then from there, a lot now, I think the majority of the faculties in architecture, of architecture in Peru start teaching uh, earthen construction. And I think that, uh, and then also, also conservation, you know, has been also a specialized uh, subject for a lot of schools of architecture in Peru and in other parts of the world. But I think that idea of embedding the, uh, the teaching of uh, traditional construction techniques in architecture schools is very important, but also in engineering schools. Right. I mean, I think in the last, uh, you know, decade or so, um, conservation engineering has become a very important uh, partner for the conservation of sites in general. And I think they are advancing and is adapting to the specific characteristic of historic buildings. They and I think they have provided a lot of information. Um, to our field that I think is, uh, is significant. So I think, you know, in those two areas, I think regarding education at the professional level is moving, uh, moving forward. Um, you know, we are advancing, there's still a lot to do, but I think in those two areas, I think we are, uh, we are moving forward. The craftsmanship is another, is another topic, right? I think in Latin America, there was, uh, uh, you know, funded by the Spanish government were these escuelas taller that exist in Peru and Cuba and I mean, other countries that I think uh, has helped also to, to shape a new generation of um, craft people that are working in, in conservation. Thanks, Claudia. We have a couple of other questions that are a little more just, a, I would say, on the philosophical or the sort of theoretical side. Um, a colleague from uh, Algeria saying, we've observed that the perception of society regarding earth and architecture and earth as a material has played against the existence of these materials in modern Algeria. People at their ancestral ways of being, building and living, uh, they, 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 they let those go to, to build modern concrete houses. Um, is this a factor in the United States or has it been studied by, by any of you, by the GCI and, and others? Do you want me to answer to that? Just would anyone like, <laughs> would anyone on the else or anyone else on the panel like to address that? Mm, sorry, I was typing uh, some responses. That's all right. Um, well, I think I think again, it gets to what you were talking about, Frank, in terms of the perception, you know, of the material. We're talking about it in the beginning and perception versus the reality of the material in terms of if it is regularly maintained and it is looked after, you know, is in fact a a, a, a very a very good building material. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I mean, I was just, um, I saw two questions, <laughs> which I responded by promising to ask you to cite them. Um, <laughs> uh, one from James Mason, one from Tony Crosby, which I think, you know, gets at this thorny problem of what happens, uh, you know, we, we, we all want to embrace tr tradition and traditional practices, but sometimes they're not going to do the job for not only the unanticipated extreme weather that, uh, and, and climatological threats that are now uh, apparent. Uh, but for a 1,000, 2,500 year old site, 
they just may, the damage may not be recoverable from the traditional practices. So how do we resolve conservation, conservation versus traditional practice? That's the question, really. I, I, you know, I'm going to partly answer it. I, I think, and again, I don't think it's a technical answer. I think the first, what you must identify is what are your goals? If your goals are to change nothing visibly, I think you're, you're out of luck. I, I mean, that has been the conservation max, axiom for years, right? Uh, you know, don't, uh, don't let the repair be visible. Don't, don't leave anything behind. Um, you know, it's like backcountry hiking. Um, I, I, I'm not so sure that's really a viable approach. And I, um, as James well knows, you know, we've been advocating, Lauren knows, we've been advocating for some pretty invasive uh, interventions that attempt to recover lost form that is more architectural than it is fabric uh, specific. Yeah, I for, the sheer, for the sheer structural resilience of the site. Sure. Um, I, I see James's question here, which I mean, which you've just, you've just, I don't see Tony's question in the, in the, uh, in the questions here, but I, maybe you just got at it. But yeah, Claudia, go ahead. Well, oh, I think a little bit of what Frank was saying, like, I think, and that's when these sort of value process system is extremely useful. Because I think, I mean, we talk about the values, historic, culture, but also there is also a value of, you know, the, structurally safe or seismically resistant uh, uh, site, right? It's a value. And in the sense that, you know, you want the building to keep being stand up, you don't want it to fall apart. So when you have a, a building that has been resilient over time, you can identify which are the elements of that structure that actually you, you know, are very significant and which are the elements who you can, that actually don't work. Uh, and never did. And, uh, and if based on the value and the value decision process, you are, per, you know, I think it's perfectly uh, feasible to modify those elements to preserve the value of a building being standing up or uh, resist uh, seismic events. So I think there is room for, uh, uh, you know, new techniques uh, to improve the uh, performance of, of, of a building. Right. Well, I was just about to say, I'm not a panelist, but I mean, I think, you know, we have to look at all knowledge systems, right? And that's what we're talking about. And if there are knowledge systems which come through science and through you know, conservation, and the, those ones complement traditional knowledge systems that, you know, again, may or may not be appropriate in certain instances, but can, can help to enhance the survival of, of, of this heritage. Lauren, did you want to say something? No, I agree completely. I think it's a balance, okay. always, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, I think, you know, looking for the most minimally invasive technique to achieve the goal, right? And I agree with Frank. I think, you know, first we have to identify the question and what it is that we're trying to preserve before we, you know, determine what the techniques and approaches are going to be. But yeah, thanks. Question here from Jake Barrow on. Can someone comment on the interpretation, it's somewhat related, on the interpretation of earthen sites versus the conservation of the materials and where those goals might collide? Um, well, I can maybe start, but I think, you know, again, similar to my last comment, it's all about balance, right? Um, I think we don't want interpretation to dictate completely conservation, but it's definitely something that we need to be considering. What are those things that the public is seeing? Where, what parts of a site are they interacting with? Um, and that may you know, guide us to a treatment approach that might be somewhat different or guide us to intervene in areas that we may not otherwise intervene because they need to be um, sort of more heavily managed, right? Um, you know, I think it's it's on us to be able to share information with those people who are providing public education, right? To ensure that um, what visitors are seeing and hearing is in line with the values of the site, the preservation approaches, decision making that's happening. Um, and you know, I think there's been over time, a disconnect between the resource manager and the sort of interpreter, right? And we're trying to remedy that and bring some of that back together. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I, go ahead, Claudia. Go ahead. Go ahead, Claudia. Uh, no, I just would like to add also that for the interpretation, also a uh, very important stakeholder is the user, right? Uh, in the sense that they also would like to have their site in a way that you know they feel um, that they have been represented. And in some cases, uh, particularly for living sites, they wanted to see their site completed. They wanted to be, they wanted their sites to be, you know, of course, safe, right? you know, like uh, easy to maintain. So I think uh, interpretation also needs to consider, uh, you know, the, the final user of uh, of the site. Uh, I was just going to say, I mean, we, we've been talking about this subject of interpretation now for a while. Um, um, in, in different ways, but I, I think it's important to recognize that all conservation is a critical process um, and it involves interpretation, even when you think it doesn't. Um, there are many ways. Uh, so one of the arguments is we preserve the fabric because the fabric and the form have important uh, historical information that can be experienced firsthand. Um, that's certainly uh, on that on my triangle that puts you for archaeological sites usually right at the corner of fabric, because we think fabric is everything, right, Lauren? You're the archeologist here. Um, so, uh, but we do it at the deference of form because the form is constantly changing on a ruined site. Um, but I would suggest we need to move a bit closer to form. And if we're dealing with uh, affiliated communities, we also need to think about function or content. Um, and so, uh, you know, I find that triadic model really helpful in testing where our implicit bias falls, given our disciplinary uh, uh, biases. Um, uh, um, it all gets back to, of course, a values-based uh, uh, conversation with every, all the stakeholders, right? We, we know this, but um, that still doesn't, I guess, answer the question. I don't know if Jake's question can be answered other than to say, acknowledge that what you're doing is a critical act and it will result in some kind of change. Um, uh, I would suggest that we embrace that and we, we work with the material in a more holistic way. Um, well, we've only got about five more minutes left and we've still got a lot of questions here. So I'm, we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, but we'll try to get to a few more of them. There's one here about, have any, pro, have any studies done a cost comparison of different preservation approaches? Additives, for example, are often cited as prolonging the need for new surface applications, but considering costs, not just labor, maintenance frequency, might reveal a need for a different approach. And I think that that question could be extended a bit, not you know, just to surface coatings, but to other things. Does anyone want to respond to that? Should be done. <laughs> well, and, and I'll say, yeah, we we do it we we do it in small scales, you know, mm -hmm. as we're developing projects, right? And I, I know the additives is directed at and at the Park Service, right? Um, because we do use them to try to prolong the life cycle, um, particularly with um, shelter coats on archaeological resources. And I'll say that. Um, you know, the upfront cost of the material may be slightly more when we're using additives, but, you know, this is also a time people money thing, right? Um, and, you know, we just don't have the capacity to be maintaining um, earthen heritage, earthen resources that are unprotected, don't have roofing systems, don't have, you know, window and door closures, don't have regular, you know, annual maintenance, you know, cycles. We just don't have the capacity to be out there doing it in, on that kind of regular basis. So um, we do use some acrylic additives um, in some of our sites. We do it very sparingly. Um, you know, we're still very cognizant of material compatibilities when we're using them. Um, but, you know, and we're, and we're watching and monitoring, we're working with Cornerstone's community partnerships right now, um, and looking at, um, you know, the clays that they're using to develop some unamended earthen shelter coats and watching them as they degrade over time to see what kind of life cycle we can get when we really work clays. Um, but it's a really complex issue, um, with the square footage that we're dealing with. Um, in our parks, and you know, Frank knows this Fort Union. I don't know what the square footage of walls is that's standing on that site at this point, but 
you know, we literally start at one end and work our way across the entirety of the site every year, and that's using amended materials. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a huge effort. Um, so, you know, I think there's probably, it's questionable, you know, that cost comparison, but we do it very often because we just don't have the people um, and the capacity to be maintaining earth and resources at the level that we would have to if we weren't adding some level of protection to them. Thanks. I always, I always like to use the um, example of Casa Grande because uh, in 1890s, mm -hmm. um, Jesse Walter Fuchs decided to put a shelter over the great house. And the moment he made that decision, he secured the material integrity of that site um, for, for, for posterity. Um, on the other hand, the other structures immediately around the shelter have had every um, non-traditional method known to man applied to it, and their form has rapidly diminished to uh, lumps and bumps in the landscape. So I ask you, where is the value? Um, however, to the point of uh, maintenance, Putting up a great shelter designed by none other than um, than Olmsted Jr. Uh, has created, of course, uh, now a classified structure for the Park Service to maintain, which is costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it saved the integrity of the original resource. So, you know, it, you, that's a great site to look at the pros and cons of what you gain, what you lose. And of course, mm -hmm. you change the landscape. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we can take one more question. And there, there are two that are actually very similar here and it might be a it, it take it'll take us back to the macro level away from sort of you know acrylics and and renders um the desertion of earthen settlements has been and still is a major cause of dilapidation in the middle east and north africa inevitably this brings with it the loss of traditional material knowledge associated with their fabrics and involving communities is not an option for authorities responsible for their conservation because the communities are no longer mm -hmm. there um, and again, there's a similar question um, about, it, again, partially inhabited, um, you know, earthen villages where the majority of the urban fabric is abandoned and degraded. And what, what do we do about those kinds of situations? Claudia, I know you dealt with some of this in Morocco, but um, what might be some approaches to, to those kinds of situations? I think settlements are certainly, a, you know, a, a big issue. Yeah, and I think also uh, generally that's the reason why we decide to, uh, you know, start with a training program in the Middle East that was targeted to, you know, participants from there, but also from uh, Northern Africa and South Asia, because you have there uh, in those countries a lot of urban settlements within the urban fabric or by itself that are gradually abandoned. And it's a big problem because as, as the person posed the question said, you cannot involve the community because the community is not there anymore. <laughs> or, you know, and it's a, it, it's a challenging situation because you need to, I mean, it not only involves the preservation of the fabric and the preservation of the, you know, the architecture, it's also, you have to restore the economic cycle that make that uh, settlement alive and mm -hmm. that's where the break has happened uh you know when in, when you look at these urban settlements they are extremely linked to the uh, agrarian landscape because they live from it they are extremely linked with the water uh, sources that you know provide water to the communities when those things are broken uh for whatever reasons because you know people leave because it's you know they they get more uh, financial prosperity in the big cities and they abandon their villages so the agrarian um, econo economy of the town is left you know to decay then the sites are also decaying so it's a whole system that need to be restored it's not just the material it's not just the fabric it's the whole system and it's more challenging and we need a you know, multidisciplinary approach to tackle um, to tackle that system. So, and we try to do that in the Morocco project involving the community, uh, you know, and the government at the local and national level. But it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's a challenge in a lot of uh, a lot of countries. Which takes us back to Frank's form, fabric, and function triangle, really, in in, in some on some level. All right, I think we're gonna to have to call this. Would Lauren or Frank like to have one last word before we, uh, we close this? 
I'm afraid we haven't been answer, able to answer all the questions. I, I will tell those whose questions were not answered that the, the panelists you know, will absolutely try to, um, to answer those in some other way we, that we can get to you. But I think we, 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 answered, we answered most of them. Um, any last words, Lauren, Frank? I just, um, I hope all the participants are looking at the, at the questions even more than the answers because there's a sizable community of, of expertise out there. The questions are as interesting as any answer could possibly be. So please look at them there. Yeah, They're absolutely. I'm sorry we don't have another hour to, to spend and there's a, a, a great esteemed group of colleagues yeah, out there. Um, Lauren? Yeah, and I'll say, you know, and it keeps, you know, repeated themes coming up in those questions that are sort of spot on to those big picture issues that we've been thinking about and looking at for years. So it's really, it's nice to know that we're not alone in those issues. And, you know, mm -hmm. the conversations that we're having internally are very likely very similar to those conversations that you all are having out there. Um, so I think, um, you know, these sessions and then the, um, the conference itself will be a great opportunity for all of us to be able to really sit down and um, talk yeah. through a lot of it. So thank you. And for me, I would just like to, before we close, um, thank all of you once again um, for this generous and I think lively um, conversation. I think it's been a wonderful start to the series of, of virtual events. I'd also like to thank the people that you can't see on the screen right now, uh, Getty Digital, Getty AV, Getty Events for their invaluable technical support, and also to Leslie Rayner and Elizabeth Levine of the GCI for coordinating and organizing this virtual event, and also uh, for the preparations they've been doing for Terra 2022 with all of you, which have not been uncomplicated, I have to say, in these, um, in these challenging times. So thank you to all of you. And if I can just have the slide back on the screen that we had before, thank you. Just to remind you, um, the next event in this series is gonna be hosted by the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, which is going to present a live event on July 8th entitled Showing Our Strength, Resilience and Compassion in the Indigenous Southwest as part of their series on Senses of Place. And in August, you'll be able to access a series of webinars from the Secret International Seminar on the Conservation and Restoration of Earth and Architecture. And then finally, next slide please. Terra 2022, as you know, is gonna take place in Santa Fe, New Mexico from June 7th to 10th, 2022. So just a year from now, the conference will be conducted in English and Spanish and is going to include a four day program of oral presentations, posters, videos, and site visits in the area. Rest of it, re registration is going to open in early fall 2021. So please do check the website that you see there on the screen for updates. And, uh, and then finally, just uh, thanks to all of you um, out there for your attendance, your attention, um, your wonderful questions and your engagement. And um, we really hope to see you to continue the conversation uh, in Santa Fe in person in 2022. Thanks to everybody and thanks again. To See you in Santa Fe. See you in Santa Fe. Bye. Bye. You there. Bye.